thank you, Professor Lee, for inviting me. And uh, it's a great honor to be amongst you here and to be able to share the Telerik story, uh, talk a little bit about where we're coming from, Bulgaria, what has changed in the last 12 years since we started our business, and um, talk about what makes a company successful. So a few words about me. My name is uh, Vasil Terziev. I'm co-founder and CEO of Telerik, a company uh, best known for its enterprise software development tools. Uh, in addition to running the company today, uh, I and the other co-founders, we try to share the knowledge that we've uh, accumulated throughout the years with other members of the community. We actively mentor startups. We talk about uh, everything we learn uh, about how to create a successful company. And uh, one of the things that makes me really happy is that 12 years down the road since we started with the other three co-founders we're still together in the company we're still friends uh, and i consider this one of the bigger accomplishments i'm based in sofia but i spend a lot of my time lately in uh, palo alto so feel free to stop by uh, at our office on university so uh, Burton already covered a few important things about Bulgaria. You know where it is on the map, just above uh, Turkey and Greece. It's a beautiful, nice country. But what most people find interesting is not the geography, not the demographics, but the last bullet that it has the lowest corporate and personal income tax in Europe, a flat 10%. And this, together with the great engineering talent that you find in uh, Bulgaria, which is uh, something of a heritage from the times of the Eastern Bloc where each country had uh, its own specialization. Uh, and Bulgaria specialized in uh, high-tech hardware, software, really helps it be what it is today, a thriving center where a lot of uh, R&D and IT is done from companies like SAP, VMware. Uh, the second biggest R&D center of VMware after Palo Alto is in Sofia, Bulgaria. So those factors, plus the fact that Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, is a, a wonderful city, make it a really nice place to, to start a business. And it's one of the reasons why I and the other founders are still based there, even though we travel quite a bit to the States lately. So getting back to Telerik, today is a, a very special day uh, for us because uh, we're releasing to the world what we internally called Telerik 3.0, our third big step, the third uh, uh, really step in our evolution from uh, a single product company to a multi-product, multinational company. Uh, today we're releasing uh, the Telerik platform, which is our vision of how uh, modern applications for web, mobile, and desktop should be built. Uh, the combination of industries leading UI tooling plus cloud services to really capture the whole software development lifecycle and enable developers to create compelling experiences across any screen. So lots of uh, familiar customers. Uh, probably all of you have used at least one application that was built with Telerik tools for web, mobile, desktop. 130,000 customers, 40,000 uh, companies, from one-man shops to some of the biggest companies in, in the world, very diverse client base. And behind all of that magic is these guys in the yellow suits. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, amazing team of over 800 people uh, spread around the world who create those products and who help our customers excel at uh, what they do. And as you can see, in addition to really working hard and uh, trying to build a professional organization, we also try to enjoy what, what we're doing, to really uh, stay true to, the, to our core values, one of which, in addition to the meritocracy of ideas, unselfishness, uh, respect for colleagues and customers, is really to play hard. And uh, we have managed to keep those core values consistent throughout the years. Our culture has changed quite a bit. and. Uh, at first, we were afraid. Over time, we understood that as the company grows to being a global company, when it scales in size, you cannot avoid in any meaningful way to change your culture. But what really matters is to stay true to your core values. And 
One of our really core values is that we look at our business like a big family and we try to instill the same the same values uh, that hold a family, a friendship in uh, at work. We spend more time with our colleagues than with our family, so we thought that the same values would probably apply. And as you can see, we try always to have a lot of fun because uh, only when you have fun at work do great results happen. It, it, it's shown in, your, um, in the output. Um, one thing we really enjoy doing is uh, engaging with the community, and by community we mean not just the developer community, user groups, events, uh, organizing our own event, uh, which from something small became one of the premier events in southeastern Europe for technology. We brought the big U.S. tech events to that place, which was completely devoid of uh, good events to our work with uh, the community. It's again something with which we uh, take great pride from you know, involvement with um, welfare projects to planting trees to doing good. Just because uh, we believe that if you are lucky to build a good business, to be healthy, to like, enjoy life, you should try to do the same for other people in a, in a meaningful way and share. It, makes you a better person, better company. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the beginning, how, how it, all, it all started. So that's one uh, very early picture. I think it was taken in 2003. Uh, that's the other co-founders here. Svetozar, Boyko, and Crystal, our CTO, the only developer from the four founders. We had an inverted pyramid. One guy doing all the work and three guys giving orders. <laughs> so uh, as I mentioned, we started it in 2002. I didn't have a very clear idea. Uh, we aspired to be a consultancy uh, just because everybody else was doing that. We, nobody in Bulgaria in 2002 was building products, doing startups. Everybody was doing outsourcing work. So we were very creative and thought we'd do the same. So. Two, three months down the road, we saw that we're in a pretty bad spot just because um, we didn't have a customer base. We didn't have time to build the customer base uh, on the international markets where we would be able to make meaningful revenue from those projects. And the local market was very, very ungrateful. Uh, people didn't want, in 2002, people didn't want to pay for anything that was virtual. If you couldn't touch it, it was worth zero. So we quickly understood that we had to do something. And um, we tried to productize one of the experimental projects of our CTO, a set of user interface libraries for the then uh, nascent Microsoft uh, .NET framework. And um, Crystal, our CTO, he gave us an ultimatum. He said, point blank, guys, you got three weeks to sell your first license. If you don't sell the first license, I'm packing the bags, going to my parents, and obviously that would have been the end to our business because we had just one developer. <laughs> and um, it was a crisis situation, so we had to do something about it. Um, Svetozar and I ramped up our marketing skills, put up this beautiful marketing collateral. Back then we were very proud of it. Now it doesn't look that pretty. Uh, but the miracle happened. and. Um, Two weeks down the road, we sold our first license to a Swiss company, then another one to a US company, and four or five weeks later, we kind of had the feeling that we've nailed it, that we have something like the possibility to build a business. Not a real business, but the possibility to build one. So we, start, uh, we started uh, canceling all the consulting work that we got and put all of our efforts into uh, building the products and the, the product side of the business. Um, one thing that we really focused on from the very early beginning was on the user experience design, making things more beautiful. Back then, everything was very ugly. So this was our way to differentiate. And it paid off. When you don't have the breadth of your competitors, you can always compensate through customer service and through user experience. And one other thing that we did was to really uh, work close with customers and offer them a special license, which included prepaid work 
And as a result, we managed to save a little bit to start hiring our first uh, people. And this was a big one. Now, it might, you might not understand what, why I put it here, but uh, when you're a web-based business and you're stuck without internet for three weeks, and all four of us had to rely on an unstable dial-up connection to work with our customers, it was, it was a very big victory, finally getting uh, working internet. So in 2006, we made a really big step. We uh, opened our office in Boston. Office meaning this one room in the Regis in uh, Newton with just one guy, but with big ambition. And um, this, is, this is the Waltham office uh, today, quite, quite bigger than the initial one in the Newton. Uh, around 2007, 2008, as the company was uh, growing, we faced one, uh, one inflection point where we had to make the decision of do we want to build a um, professional business or do we want to keep it a cowboy run lifestyle business. We opted for growth. We decided we want to build a big, sustainable, high quality business. And that was one of the reasons why we uh, took investment from Summit Partners, a leading uh, VC and private equity company. Uh, they've been a great partner and they've helped us a lot to shape Teleric to mature the business and prepare it for what was uh, to come in the next few years of uh, quick growth. So as you can see by the numbers, the business was growing pretty, pretty fast. And we hit the problem that uh, many other growing businesses also struggle with. And it was with finding quickly quality, high quality talent, people who are prepared to make uh, a contribution from day one, to be successful on the job. And there weren't that many people to really fuel our business. So we created the Teleric Academy. And it's something that I am personally, one of the things I'm most proud of, uh, uh, because this is our mini university. Uh, it started off as a small idea to provide training for the employees that were going to start a job at Teleric. And today, it's the leading non-government uh, educational institution in, in Bulgaria. We work with kids from fourth grade to people who have just graduated from university, provide free training in 40 plus courses, prepare people from you know, basic skills of programming, retraining them to providing intensive seven month uh, courses in software development uh, and engineering in quality assurance. And uh, it has worked great for us because we've been able to attract some of the best people coming from the ranks of the academy. It has worked well for uh, the ecosystem at large because nine out of 10 people would join the ranks of other companies, competitors, and it has just created a very healthy uh, effect on the ecosystem. Fast forward to 2013, another big milestone in our history. After 11 years in business, we finally figured out that the Silicon Valley is an important place for a technology business. As they say, better, better late than never. Uh, but it has been a great experience for us. Uh, and you know, being here is very different than reading about here from TechCrunch, Pando Daily, and just following the news. Uh, we've been able to attract uh, a great uh, group of people. And one thing that, that changed you know, being here, immersing yourself in, in, in this world was that our ambitions changed and our view of what Teleric can be and will be changed. So it was a really important and great step for us. This is our office uh, uh, above the Palo Alto bicycle. So if any of you feels like stopping by having a chat, feel free to, to stop by. So I uh, just want to finish with a few words about uh, the startup ecosystem in Bulgaria. Uh, which is not yet Estonia. Uh, we don't get those successful startups. We don't get uh, that much news coverage. But being involved in it and seeing the progress of the last two years has been a really amazing experience. Seeing the quality of the, the startups, the ideas, what we've been able to accomplish is a network of uh, mentors, of incubators, of uh, uh, 
uh, instruments to fund those startups has been has been great and I'm pretty sure that all of you guys will be hearing a lot more about nice startups coming from Bulgaria I see one one over there hi guys so many things have changed for for the better um, the infrastructure overall changed legislation tax code everything you can think of changed for the better but one thing did not change and it's pretty universal for Bulgaria and for the rest of the world you really need a great idea and a great team you need a lot of passion dedication hard work and a little bit of luck to really make it a real business and speaking of a of a team I just wanted to say a big thank you to our team the the Teleric team the people whose hard work really made it possible for uh, me to get invited and speak in front of you so big thank you for being a wonderful audience and i guess now it's time for questions thank you Buffy. questions yes thank you yes sir and I'm uh, very happy to meet you. I am the Honorary Council of Romania, but I am uh, also with my company one of the first clients that you guys had from the beginning. And uh, our developers of Romania went to your nice conference. So we Thank know you. you very well. I have a question because uh, we know from the Romanian point of view that many of our startups they go to Bulgaria mm -hmm. because the infrastructure compared uh, Bulgaria with Romania apparently is much more friendly than in Romania. What I would like to know, what was the trigger which created this boom in the infrastructure and, and how, what was the trigger to bring the angel money and the investment to Bulgaria? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't really know how the pan-European decisions on who to fund, you know, speaking of the European investment fund work, but uh, I think what happened in Bulgaria is really a factor of people. The, the people who are running those accelerators uh, and everyone in, in the community and their passion. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed by the, the, the community spirit and how everyone feels that it's their mission to really uh, make this thing work. Uh, I, I believe this is, this is the key to success, the unselfishness. And it's very close to what I've seen here in the Valley as uh, just an overall mentality that unlike the, the typical Balkan or uh, European approaches, I do something for you, you do something for me, you know, the quid pro quo, like in the valley, we're at this stage where everybody is just doing good for the sake of doing good and passing on and expecting that at some point it's going to come back to them. And this, this unique spirit, I think, is what, what uh, triggered everything and it just accelerates. And it's amazing to see those uh, results. Thank you, George. Yes. Uh, how important was the company culture and the entrepreneurs in your company for your success today? I think culture, it's a personal opinion, but I think culture is going, it makes or breaks companies. It's what, as we uh, talk about it internally, it's your immune system. It helps you survive bugs. <laughs> it uh, makes you stronger once you get past the bugs and it helps you deal with, with all the challenges. So, uh, but I, I just want to make another key uh, point, the difference between core values and culture, because culture changes. And at first I didn't know that these two are different, but what should stay the same is values, you know, who you are as people, what, what are the unbreakable rules in your relationships and how you see the world, Th that, that shouldn't change, you know. Culture, it changes. I mean, uh, with every new office, with every uh, international um, person we've, we've hired, the culture changed. The, the way we communicate, the way we think about the business, scale, the markets in which we operate, it changes. So changing culture, good. Changing values, bad. And what about the entrepreneurs? Do you celebrate them or do you allow the people, the, the innovative role, and to have suggestions to you? And Back to the C stuff or? Yeah, well, uh, as I said, one of our core values is the meritocracy of ideas. So when you become a bigger company, you can't avoid structure. 
but structure is really about the execution engine, how you make things work, how you manage uh, changes. But we're like a startup when it comes to the flow of ideas. The good ideas should be supported, and every manager, leader in the company knows that and promotes the good ideas. And we celebrate failure as much as we can. <laughs> Question over here. So in 2006, you decided to go to Boston. Why mm -hmm. Boston and not Silicon Valley at that point? Uh, because we didn't know anybody in Silicon Valley, and my college roommate was based in Boston. So <laughs> we had trust in him, knew he's a good guy, and uh, apparently he had uh, the passion to, to do things. Um, question for you. So when I, when I was in Sofia last March, I was told something that was quite extraordinary. I, I was told that um, the number of Groupon clones that had been created in Bulgaria was 83. Wow. Now, I haven't been able to verify that number. Uh, this I was had 38. The same numbers, but reversed. OK. <laughs> 38 or 83, that's, that's a lot of cloning. Um, do you see the number of clones coming down now today versus a couple of years ago? Uh, cl cloning is a, it's a symptom of lack of good ideas, lack of communication, isolation from the global ecosystem. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it involves many issues. I, I actually never, never followed the group on clones because I didn't think they're, they're that interesting. Uh, friends of mine built the first group on clone. And from there, there was an avalanche of others. But uh, judging from the progress of the last few years, uh, from the first uh, events to, to really uh, promote entrepreneurship, uh, the Empower program, if you're familiar, uh, to what uh, happens today with Launch Hub and with Eleven, I've seen tremendous progress, both in terms of uh, the number of uh, startups and ideas and the quality of those ideas. Uh, reading some of the first business plans, not, I, I wasn't impressed by the ideas. But today, uh, I'm on the investment committee of 11. It's really hard to pick uh, from, from all those great ideas what, what to fund. So it, it's a good sign that things are going in the right direction. And those are not clones. Many of those are really innovative ideas uh, and not just uh, a clone of a social app or uh, service that you'd find here trying to localize it for a smaller market. So you're seeing increased numbers of companies, so increased deal flow, but also higher quality as, as well? I don't think we're at the stage where we have increased deal flow, uh, meaning we're just starting, because it, it's a funnel. If you don't build the top of the funnel, all those uh, smaller companies that then get seed, then get uh, VC money, uh, you can't really build an ecosystem. So we're at the very top, but some of those uh, companies are really successful in now uh, getting seed funding, and I believe that they'll be able to create sustainable businesses. Uh, just for clarification, Launch Hub and Eleven are two new venture funds, accelerators yeah. that have been supported by the European Investment Fund under the Jeremy program yeah. in the last year and a half. Year and a half. Right. And I, w I met both teams when I was there. I was very impressed with, uh, with all the investment uh, management people, um, experienced former entrepreneurs, current entrepreneurs. For a very young ecosystem, I thought Bulgaria was, was quite impressive. Uh, next question. Yes, Val. Okay. Uh, what was the most difficult uh, time in your company? And obviously, you made the decision left or right that saved the company. Do you have this type of experience, drama? Other than the drama with the internet? <laughs> That was that was that was a big point of drama because you know we invented the online offline experience. <laughs> I, I had to unhook my computer, bring it to Svetozar's desk, hook it in, get my emails, unhook it, move it to my desk, and then crunch emails all day long. And this this happened for three weeks. Now, jokes aside, one of the uh, biggest challenges for us was really managing managing growth. 
we grew too quickly and we didn't manage to really build uh, the right uh, set of middle management within, within the company. We ourselves weren't uh, that experienced uh, managers. The guys who we promoted were not. So at some point we cr had a big structure which was not really functioning super well. And it took us a good uh, deal of time to clean it up put everything in control and really start managing that properly, set the right expectations, set the right KPIs, measurements, and really become a professional organization. And you know, the, uh, the VC investment we took was one of those things that really helped us transform uh, the company for the better. But yes. you know, Val, yes, uh, these types of things, they happen all the time. Every day it's a struggle, you know. Every time I think we're, we're past this challenge, now it's going to be all roses, and they, they just change their color, but challenges stay. So we have a question from Dusan Stojanovic. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with who Dusan is, he was awarded the prize of, correct me, the best angel investor in Europe for 2013. Is that? That's correct. Yes, that's correct. And you're based in Sweden? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm from Southeast Europe. As yes. Well. Uh, welcome to Stanford. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm extremely impressed that I met once before of what you achieved because it's so rare in Europe, especially. But w w what next? What do you have in the plan for the future, for the kind of next couple of years? Well, for the next couple of years, we're trying to stay on track with with our ambition to to really build a big successful, sustainable business. Uh, whether we're going to go you know, public at some point or whether it's going to be uh, some sort of strategic exit, whether it's going to be some other event, you, ne you never know. But we've always had the belief that if you do what's right every day, if you don't compromise, <coughs> if you work hard to keep your customers happy and to keep your employees happy, the sky's the limit. So, we're shooting for the sky. <laughs> so just to put things, oh yes, one question back here at the end. So uh, I'm just curious, is the Hungarian uh, startup scene mostly revolving around software, or are there other industries such as medtech, cleantech, that are sort of evolving? Mm -hmm. More uh, capital intensive, I guess. It's, it's mostly software. There are some good ideas around industrial design, around uh, uh, clean, uh, clean technologies and whatnot, but most of the investments today happen in, in software. And the reason is b that those are much, much uh, easier to make, much easier to scale, and they're not that capital intensive. So when you're laying the foundation, you're looking for more or less quick wins. And software it presents the best opportunity to really get the wheel turning. So, <coughs> Um, I don't know if, how many of you are following what's happening on University Avenue, but University Avenue is becoming the new Sand Hill Road of Silicon Valley. Uh, the German Accelerator has recently just located there from Plug and Play. Innovation House, which is run by the Norwegians, is just off University Avenue. Telerik is right over the bike shop. You know, to go from Sofia to downtown Palo Alto is a very strong statement. The Finns also have their office. Uh, on or near University Avenue. So this is a great presence for Bulgaria to have in the heart of Silicon Valley. And I hope we see a lot more of Telerik in the coming months and years.